What I'm going to be covering is the move from a concept of reason to the concept of a formalism in mathematics and logic. I'll then be looking at Turing's conception of mathematics, a very concrete conception of mathematics. I'll then look at the Turing machine that he proposed or invented, the halting problem, which was his most significant mathematical discovery, the work he did in code breaking, and his final discussions about whether machines could think. If you go back to classical philosophy, reason is seen to be a special faculty of the human soul. And the power of reason was seen to be what distinguished humans from animals. Now, although reason was seen to be an innate faculty of the soul, it was recognised that there were rules for correct reasoning, and these were developed by philosophers like Aristotle. So it was accepted that reasoning was something that could be taught, and it was in some way associated with rules. In the 19th century, the mathematician Boole published a book called The Laws of Thought, in which he attempted to show that reasoning could be treated as a specialised branch of mathematics in which the only numbers you had are 0 and 1. He says, let us conceive then of an algebra in which the symbols x, y, z, etc. admit indifferently to the value 0 and 1 and of these values alone the laws, the axioms and the processes of such an algebra will be identical in their whole extent with the laws, the axioms and the processes of an algebra of logic. So he's saying, given this limited range of numbers, 0 and 1, you can construct a set of mathematical operations which correspond to what he took to be the laws of thought. Now, the logic that he invented, now called Boolean logic, is the basis of all modern computing and data processing. You can listen to this and watch this only through the practical application of Boolean logic. Now, why 0 and 1? Well, the convention is that true is 1 and false is 0. And why is AND equivalent to multiplication according to Boole. Well, if you have two propositions which are both true, proposition 1 and proposition true is also true, which is the case if you multiply 1 and 1 together. On the other hand, if you have some rule which is only true if both are true and one is true and, one is, and the other is false, that's equivalent to multiplying 1 times 0, which gives you 0, since the end result is false. By an analogous process, he showed that OR was a variant of the mathematical operation Following plus. Following on from Boole, later 19th century mathematicians developed techniques whereby you could express any logical proposition in terms of mathematical symbols. They invented a new set of mathematical symbols for this process. So, the rather odd-looking formula here says that for all A, for all B, A or B is equivalent to not, not B or not A. And that is a rule developed by the logician de Morgan, for example. Reasoning then became the same as a manipulation of symbols. It became a form of calculation something that the mathematician Leibniz had hoped to achieve in, in, in an earlier period. <coughs> then, with the start of the 20th century, you got the formless project in, mathema in mathematics. You had the mathematician and philosopher Bertrand Russell asking whether all of maths could be founded on logic. Could you lo use logic to deduce any true proposition in maths? More generally, let's look at the obverse. 
can any can the truth or falsehood of any mathematical problem be determined by purely formal or mechanical means by applying symbol substitution in the procedures of formal logic this was called the decision problem or in german the entscheidungsproblem and was proposed by the fam famous mathematician Hilbert in 1928. The, Turing made his name in 1936 by publishing a paper which showed there was no solution to the decision problem. In order to do this, he actually developed the idea of the universal computer and in the process, he transformed how we now understand computation and reasoning. He did all this at the age of only 24. A key point was that Turing looked at what mathematicians did as an actual labor process, work process, taking into account the limited abilities of the human perceptual system and the human brain. For Turing, what a mathematician did was to look at a small number of symbols at a time. The mathematician had a limited internal memory or state of mind which he could use for calculations. <coughs> they had a set of learned tricks or rules of thumb and they also had a pencil and paper to write things down on or a blackboard to write things down on. This addition of the blackboard, pencil and paper, abacus, some external form of recording, something that Turing emphasises, and people abstractly talking about mathematical reasoning had in the past tended to underestimate. Let's take an example from school arithmetic. If I want to add 13 to 28, what steps do I go through? Well, first I add 3 plus 8, which gives me 11. Now that's a learned rule of thumb, which as a primary school child, you have to learn off by heart. So you have certain learned rules of thumb. At that point though, you then learn that you have to carry 10. So you write a 1 up here, and you write a one below. So here we have the learned rules of thumb and the process of writing additional symbols as an essential part of the calculation. Next, we start adding the next column. So we add the one and one. So we're only perceiving these two symbols at the moment. I've circled them to show the field of view that we use. At that point, we apply a rule of thumb and in our head store the number two. So we have an internal state of mind that remembers the number two. On encountering the next symbol, two here, we apply the rule of thumb two plus two equals four. In the end, we result, put the result four down on the bottom line. Same kind of process occurs if you're using algebra. So suppose I want to multiply x into a plus b. I scan through, read x. Remember that's what I'm multiplying by. Read the, the bracket, copy it. But I'm still remembering x. I read the a, write down xa. Read the, the plus, write it, copy it down. I then read B, but I'm still remembering A. Sorry, I'm still remembering X. So I write XB. And then I write the final bracket. At each stage, you only remember a little and keep looking at the formula to, for the next thing to do. So you have a hand-eye process going from one symbol to another and the hand then writes a symbol down. Recall that Hilbert had asked whether there was any purely mechanical process by which you could determine the truth and falsehood of a mathematical proposition. Well, the innovative step that Turing made 
was to say, let's take that literally. Let's see if we can propose an actual machine that could do this. And provided the machine can do the same things as the mathematician has to do, then this machine should be able to do anything a mathematician can do. So he says he needs a machine that can detect a small number of symbols at a time. It must have some finite internal memory or finite number of states. It must have a set of rules of thumb which we'll assume are in read-only memory to use modern terminology. And it has to have a read-write memory to record the calculations to perform the same rule as the sheet of paper does for a mathematician. Given that, he said, the machine could do all that a mathematician did, because that's all a mathematician does. If I can do that on a machine, then the machine will substitute for the mathematician. And since we are concerned with what purely mechanical procedures could be used, if I can answer things about what the machine could do, I can answer what a mathematician could do by mechanical procedures. The machine Turing proposed was a hypothetical one, but a hypothetical one shaped by the available technology of the 1930s. He never actually built the machine he proposed in 1936, but in more recent years a number of them have been built to his original proposal. And this shows one built recently. It has a tape which symbols can be read and written on. There is an apparatus here for writing symbols or write, wiping them out. And there is a detector to tell what the symbol is. Viewed in more detail, here is the tape on which zeros and ones or nothing no marks at all can be applied. Um, there is a read-only memory, a table, which says, depending on what your state is, A, B, C, etc., if you encounter a zero, write symbol one, move the tape to the left, and move to next state, B. So it, the rules always consist of a symbol to write, a rule to move to the left or the right and the next state you go into. This is what you would nowadays call the microcode of your computer. He was proposing the idea that the computer had a microcode but the main program, the main data, would be stored on the read-write memory of this tape. People don't generally look at the mechanics of it they just symbol, symbolically represent one of these Turing machines. It has a rules table, a read-write head, and typically you have a program followed by data on the tape. Now, that seems a bit odd nowadays, but in the 1950s, this is what computers looked like. They use magnetic tape, not paper tape, but much commercial data processing worked on machines which were not so dissimilar to the basic ideas that Turing had proposed in the 1930s. He didn't get to actually build a general purpose computer until the late 40s, early 50s because of the intervention of the war. The machine he designed and was actually completed in his lifetime was called Pilot Ace. ACE standing for Automatic Computing Engine, and it's still preserved in the Science Museum in London. Here you see all the racks of thermionic valves which did the logic. The memory, instead of being a paper tape, was a mercury delay line, that is to say a tube filled with mercury into which acoustic pulses were passed the acoustic pulses would travel down the delay line in less than a, a millisecond. And by setting a large number of pulses down this delay line, you could store several thousand bits on the delay line. And the delay line therefore acted like the paper tape, but had a very much faster access time. 
you can only move paper tape at a you know one one or two positions a second this time this could move the read through the entire delay line all the bits on the delay line um, thousands of bits every every um, millisecond so it was very much faster and eventually an even larger version after it was built after his death called the ace Turing said that any system of mathematical rules or axioms can be written as a computer program. He can therefore cast the decision program problem as deciding whether a program made up of these axioms will halt with a yes or no answer when given the theorem. But here we have a problem. What if the computer never stops? Can we show that a computer given the axioms and a theorem will halt with a true or false answer? If we have a general method for showing that, then we have a general method for showing that a set of axioms applied to a theorem can result in a definite answer and we've solved the decision problem. But in fact, Turing showed the opposite. He showed that it was impossible to have a general procedure for showing if a program will halt. And hence he showed that the decision problem is unsolvable. Turing's proof is a classic sort of proof, a proof by contradiction. Initially he says, let's assume that it is possible to tell whether a given program P will halt on input I. And we'll assume that there exists a subroutine called halt, which will return true if P halts on I. He then says, let us define a new procedure Z, which takes a, a string X. And this procedure Z is very simple. It says, if halt X, X, that is to say, if X halts on X, then loop forever, otherwise halt. Then what happens if we run Z on Z? Well, As we run that, internally, you get a call of halt Z on Z. And there are two cases to consider here. Either program Z halts on input Z, in which case halt will return true. Halt will return true here. And if halt returns true, Z then loops forever. But that is a contradiction because we've previously assumed that halt Z halts on input Z. Alternatively, let's assume Z loops forever on input Z. It follows that the halt function must return false on input Z. Hence, the program Z must halt on input Z, which contradicts what we assumed at the top here. Hence, the very existence of the halting function leads to a contradiction. <clears throat> what are the implications of this? Firstly, it sets <coughs> limits on what can be achieved by mathematical reasoning. It indicates that there can be no general way of seeing if an arbitrary mathematical formula follows from a given set of axioms. It also sets limits on our ability to prove the correctness of software, which is obviously of great practical significance. What it does not show is that nothing can be proved in maths, nor does it show that there is no provably correct software. What it does show is there can be no general method for proving the correctness of software. There may be particular ways of proving that particular programs are correct, but no general way of doing this. Reason starts out as being seen as a faculty of the human soul. With Boole, it comes to be seen as a formal process, a process of manipulating signs. With Turing, it becomes literally a mechanical process in the sense of 
something done by machines. And of course, we're used to it being done by machines now. The effect of this is it put reason on an entirely material foundation. It's no longer seen as something ideal, something of the airy spirits. This, of course, is a great advance for mechanical materialism. I'm now going to look at what Turing did during the hostilities 39 to 45 when he was working on code breaking. Starting in the 1920s, the German armed forces adopted a commercial enciphering machine called Enigma, which was fairly widely sold for commercial purposes, but had one or two additional complexities added for military use. It had a keyboard in which you typed the message, letter by letter, <coughs> As you typed each letter, one of these lights would light up. So if you typed an A, you wouldn't get an A lighting up, but some other letter would light up. A second operator copied down the translated letters and then sent them by Morse code or on a radio link. It had three rotors which did the enciphering, or most of the enciphering. Each rotor had 26 contacts on each side and a mass of wires which jumbled up the connections between the letters so that G might go to Q. Every letter is jumbled up so it goes to a different letter from itself. So each rotor is substituting one letter for another but there are three rotors one after the other. A simple substitution cipher has been, had been known for a very long time and would be easy to break. What made this different is that the signal went through the three rotors and came back out again. That's still a substitution cipher, but what made it more complicated was that at each key press, the rotors move round like a car mileometer. And that gives a new encipherment, so that after pressing the A, the right rotor clicks round by one position. And that alters the encipherment for the next time you press A. So this time it might come out to C. Once the right rotor had gone round 26 positions, the middle rotor is advanced by one. And then after that, the left rotor is advanced by one after the middle has gone around 26 positions. So that on a long message, the enciphering changes with each letter that is sent. At the start of the day, there is a day setting on the rotors. And that same day setting is used every time you start a message. So on a given day, the day setting might be RDK. You set the rotors to RDK at the beginning of the message. If you knew the day setting, you would be able to decrypt the message because a property of the um, Enigma machine is that if A went to G, G went to A. So that the same day setting could be used to decrypt the message at the end. That's fine. It appears a very secure message uh, encryption system. You, you cannot apply simple frequency analysis to find which letter is E, for example, because there's not a stable relationship between what letter E is translated into as you go through the message. However, there are certain loopholes introduced by poor practice by the people sending the messages. For example, certain ships or weather stations might send out a standard set of, of letters at the start of each daily message. So they might be saying, Wetter für die Nacht, saying the night's weather is. You don't know what the rest of the message is, but you know the leading letters of it. And that is termed a crib or cheat. 
Before the war, Turing had been working on the decision problem. Decision problem in the mathematical sense of whether axioms A lead to a theorem T, which I'm showing as D, A implies T. In the Turing machine, A and T were both numbers on the tape. The equivalent problem in decryption was to determine if a setting of the rotors, S, and a crib, which was an initial sequence of letters, produce a ciphertext that you detect from the weather station, T. So you're trying to determine if D, the decision is, does SC imply T? Now you don't know what S is, you know what C is, but S can be encoded as a number. It's a number base 26, three digit number base 26. And in principle, you can build a machine which will systematically search through all the settings until it comes up with one which returns the correct ciphertext. Which you've recorded the ciphertext that you picked up today from the weather station. You know what the crib is, so you run a machine to see this. This is the machine that uh, Turing developed, the bomb. And what it did was perform parallel searches on multiple different possible settings of the machine until it came up with one which gave the right answer. Now, there's considerable extra logic in this that had to do with that an additional component of the uh, Enigma machine, the plug board here, which enabled further scrambling to be carried out and the plug board settings were changed each day. But Turing came up with certain mathematical invariants which enabled you to eliminate most of the possible plug board settings and relatively rapidly arrive at the plug board settings. Now what this has in common with the Turing machine is that he thinks of this as a mathematical problem to which a mechanical decision procedure can be established. And this was the mechanical decision procedure. If you want to find out more about this, it's more complicated than I'm explaining. Um, you read the essential Turing, chapter six. Now, what was the lasting impact of Turing's work? A key point that he makes is that digital computers are universal. He says a digital computer is a universal machine in the sense that it can replace any machine in a very wide class. Now, this has been accepted in computer science that any useful computing machine or highest power computing machine must be equivalent to Turing's original proposal for a Turing machine. So people talk about machines being Turing equivalent and any, any machine that's going to carry out general purpose computation has to be Turing equivalent. The most obvious one is the von Neumann architecture, which was developed in the 1940s by von Neumann after he'd conversed with Turing, which was a machine which had a random access read-write memory which stored both program and data. And that's what the standard computers we use today are. Now, the universality has another implication. The universality of computers is similar to the universality of humans. Such a thing as abstract labor only exists because we're universal robots. And remember, robot originally just meant worker in check. We're universal workers. We can, if there are enough of us and we have enough time, do any work. People have to be trained, but people can be trained to do any work. And it is this universality of labor, which fundamentally is the reason why labor can be a source of value. But it also means that computers have a potentially huge economic impact because a standard design of mass-produced computer can, with appropriate software, be used in a huge variety of different concrete tasks. 
The next point that Turing made that has lasted and has influenced people is the idea that computers could think. He started advocating this openly in the early 1950s, but he was probably thinking about it well before that. He argued strongly that, firstly, that computers could be made to learn. And since then, we have the whole field of machine learning, which has become a practical and important activity in the 21st century. He also said that, in principle, computers could think, and that in the future, they would be able to converse with us in a way that was indistinguishable from communicating with a person, provided that we were communicating with them by typing messages and didn't have to see them. Now, all of those things seem increasingly plausible. We know that computers can learn. They do things which, were they done by human beings, would be said to involve thinking. And increasingly, they are used to substitute for human beings in conversing with people, jobs that were formerly call center jobs, certain automated answering of, or simple or answering of telephone calls is now done by automated systems. So that not only is the conversion, conversation done, but now the conversation has moved from being one that is based on typing to the computers are now able to recognize and interact via spoken voice. On whether a machine could have feelings, Turing said, I'll never know whether they have feelings, any more than I shall ever be quite certain that you feel as I do. He's saying the basis for attributing feelings to other human beings would in the end be philosophically no weaker than attributing feelings to intelligent machines. If you want to read further about this, about Turing, there's a collection of his works called The Essential Turing with good introductions to each section by Jack Copeland. And if you want to understand some of the more theoretical points about decision procedures and the halting problem, books by Gregory Chaitin are a good start. And I give as an example The Unknowable by Gregory Chaitin.